Hi there, and welcome to today's webinar event on the role of sensors in pneumatic cylinder maintenance. My name is Anna Wells, and I'm the executive editor of Impo Magazine. I'll serve as your moderator for today's event. Today we're joined by smart technology expert Jeremy King as he leads an engaging discussion on the role that sensors play in maintaining critical equipment. He will analyze the different maintenance strategies for pneumatic actuators and how intelligent sensors can help guide your maintenance schedule. We will cover a lot of critical points, including determining when a pneumatic cylinder should be replaced, understanding the importance of sensors in a maintenance routine, and implementing real-time monitoring tools to keep pneumatics running. A little bit about Jeremy. So Jeremy King is the IntelliSense product marketing manager with Bimba Manufacturing. Jeremy is an experienced product manager working with industrial sensors, and prior to working with sensors, Jeremy spent 11 years as a mechanical design engineer in the automotive industry. So before we have Jeremy kick off, we just have a few housekeeping items that I want to go over real quick here. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a taskbar. Each icon on the taskbar is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. So if you're unsure about what an icon does, you can hover, hover over that icon with your mouse, and a box will pop up that tells you the function. Um, please take our survey following the webinar by clicking on the survey icon in the taskbar. Uh, below the presenter photo, there is a blank questions box that allows you to type a question in the box and then hit the submit button to send it to us. So you can enter your questions anytime throughout the live presentation, and then later on our presenter is going to address as many of those questions as possible. Uh, today's event is being recorded and archived. All registered participants will receive an email within one to two business days that has a link to view a recording of this event on demand. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to Jeremy King with Bimba Manufacturing. Great. Thank you, Anna. And good afternoon, good morning uh, to everybody on the webinar today. Um, Bimba Manufacturing is one of the world's leaders in pneumatic actuators. Uh, Charlie Bimba, our founder in 1957, actually invented the disposable pneumatic cylinder. Uh, so we've been doing a lot with pneumatic actuation for a long time. So we wanted to really today come out and talk to you a little bit more about how to expand your use of uh, pneumatic cylinders and what role sensing can play in that uh, expansion of the use of those cylinders. So uh, next slide, there we go. So the agenda today, I'm going to go over some of the sensing technologies that are available for pneumatics, some of the traditional ones that uh, you might be familiar with, as well as some of the newer ones that uh, we're coming out with, like our IntelliSense product, uh, which is just new to the market today, actually, so we're excited about that. Uh, why do cylinders need to be replaced? So that's an important question you need to ask yourself, why your cylinder would need to be replaced, why is it failing, and what does that, how does that impact uh, the decisions you make both in sensing and in cylinder choice. Um, maintenance strategies, some of the advantages and disadvantages of some traditional strategies um, and the role sensors can play in both of those. And when you would use each of those to uh, monitor or maintain your cylinder. Wrap it up with some conclusions and then we'll move into your questions. So it should be a pretty informative webinar today, I think. So traditionally, there are two different aspects of a pneumatic actuator that you might want to measure. Uh, aspects of the fluid or the air that's driving the cylinder and aspects of the cylinder itself, primarily position. Um, so on the fluid side, there are two different ways you can do that. You can use a pressure uh, Traditionally, pressure gauges are used in line in your pneumatic uh, circuit as a way to measure line pressure make sure you're supplying enough air to different regions of your factory, uh, diagnose leaks, um, you know, if not enough air is getting to a certain region, you can use a, a line gauge to, to detect that. Um, the other way you're measuring fluid is using a flow sensor. If you've got a delay circuit in your uh, cylinder and you want to know exactly how much air is going into that at what rate, if you're doing a filling application at the end of a line using air, uh, you can use a flow sensor to measure those types of aspects. The other way you would want to measure, so is it extended, is it retracted, is it somewhere in between? Uh, traditionally, this is done with either a electric switch, which is a reed switch type uh, situation, where you've got a magnetic um, 
a magnetic uh, rod in your cylinder that as it travels past the switch, it sends a signal off to your PLC or whatever other monitoring device you're using to tell you that you've extended or retracted or passed a critical point. Uh, or a proximity sensor, this would be mounted external to the cylinder and used to make sure an actuator is approaching its final position, either extended or retracted, and can be used to send a signal to the switch to, um, well, the pneumatic switch, valve, to switch directions or change your controls. So those are the classical ways you can measure um, cylinder position or cylinder airflow. What we're going to talk about today primarily is the role of pressure sensors and more importantly, smart pressure sensors in diagnosing, maintaining, and monitoring the health of your pneumatic system um, as you go through your plant operations. So let's talk for a minute on why do cylinders need to be replaced. Um, you know, traditionally there are two types of pneumatic actuators. There's a disposable style, uh, which is usually a lower cost, um, lighter weight cylinder that's meant to run for a set amount of time. Uh, Bemba cylinders are rated for 3,000 miles of actuation, quite a few cycles or a repairable cylinder. So there are cylinders out there that are designed to come apart and you can go in and replace the seals. And your cylinder seals are the key to the life of your cylinder. Um, they're really where you're going to run in, they're really what's going to cause your uh, failure. And we usually see failure in pneumatic cylinders in one of two ways. Uh, there's insufficient force being applied to the cylinder to move whatever load is on the end of the actuator, or the cylinder is not responding fast enough. So it can still move the load, but it doesn't move that load in the amount of time you need it to. So if there's a very critical sequencing application or, um, or yeah, a time, time sensitive uh, aspect to your manufacturing, you need that cylinder actuate in a set amount of time or else it's considered bad. Um, some users have actually started moving to measuring air leakage as a, a determination of failure. So even though the cylinder is still actuating in the, uh, fast enough or still moving the load, the loss of air from the system is great enough that they consider that a failed, failed cylinder because of the cost of the air uh, and the cost to produce the air, or maybe a drain at one actuator will impact the performance of another actuator elsewhere in the circuit. So with excess air leakage, one of the things you might want to consider there is if your cylinder is leaking more than it needs to, or more than you would like, but it's still actuating uh, fast enough or still moving the load adequately, you might want to look at the uh, size of your cylinder, and it could, you could potentially use a smaller, more efficient cylinder in that application so that you're the failure of your cylinder and you're not uh, oversizing your, your application. The last failure mode is a bent rod. This is something that you're not really going to pick up with any sort of uh, sensors, but if your load gets jammed or uh, you've got too much side load, especially on a very long extension cylinder. Over time, your rod will bend. Uh, the cylinder might still function uh, perfectly well, but what that's going to cause to happen is over time, your rod seal is going to fail. It's going to wear out prematurely, and you're not going to get as many cycles out of your cylinders as you would like because of the bend in the rod. Um, so. What are your failure modes driven by? On a insufficient force is most likely on an extension. So when you're extending the rod from the cylinder, that's going to be one of your piston seals is no longer sealing properly. And air is getting past the piston and going into the front and exhausting the atmosphere. If your cylinder is not retracting fast enough, that's typically going to be either a piston seal failure or a rod tail failure. So air is escape when you apply air to the retract stroke, air is leaking out of one of two locations. So those are kind of the main ways a cylinder fails. And there are lots of things you can do um, with proper seal selection for your application and lubrication 
to make sure that those last as long as possible. But those are wearable materials and they are meant to wear out over time. So you know your cylinder is going to wear over time. What are your options for replacing that cylinder? There are three classic maintenance strategies. Um, you know, everybody's got their own name for different maintenance strategies, uh, different approaches. But from what I've, my experience is they fall into three buckets. It's either a corrective strategy, a preventative strategy, or a condition-based strategy. Um, I'm going to spend a little time going into each of these, and we'll um, address how sensors can be used in each of these. So corrective maintenance is the practice of diagnosing and replacing items after they have failed. So you'll run your cylinder until it no longer moves the load or no longer moves the load fast enough. This is traditionally the easiest way to implement a maintenance strategy. Uh, and there's, there's some advantages to it. Like I said, it's very easy to implement. All you have to do is wait for a cylinder to fail and then replace it. Um, and there's really no sub cost other than you probably would want to inventory uh, some cylinders to minimize your downtime. So if you're running your equipment until it fails and you don't have a replacement cylinder in stock, uh, you're setting yourself up some, for, for some extended downtime while you wait for that new cylinder to arrive a couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on the situation. Um, so there are greater long-term costs as a result of that. Um, you, you're, you're on, your downtime is unexpected. You know, you're not looking at when the system's going to fail. You're just waiting for it to fail. It could take multiple steps to diagnose the failure. So you've got no way to monitor what's going on in your system. Something fails, and nine times out of ten, you know that your rod seal has worn out because that's what always happens with your, your particular piece of equipment. Well, on that tenth time you go, you put that shiny new cylinder that you just you had sitting on your shelf, and the problem's not solved. So now you have to go back and do more diagnostics and realize maybe it was something in the, re or the valve that failed or your regulator that was leaking. So there are other places that the system may have failed that you're not going to catch right away. So you have to go back multiple times to fix a problem. And then managing repair inventory. You know, you might keep a couple of cylinders in stock, which is great, but if you, you know, if something else fails, you're not necessarily going to have that in stock, or you might have six of one cylinder and not enough of the other. So there's, there's lots of inventory management uh, issues that arise out of a corrective maintenance strategy. That being said, there are definitely times you would want to use it. So when the cost of the failed cylinder is less than the cost of replacing the cylinder or monitoring the cylinder. So other maintenance strategies, you have to add uh, sensing technology to monitor the performance of the cylinder or you have to set up a uh, preventative maintenance strategy where every month, every six months on a set schedule, you replace the cylinder. Well, those are a little more expensive at times, depending on your application. If it's a, you know, it's a, a very small cylinder that's easy to get to, uh, it's a couple of bolts and you can replace it in 10 minutes and you're back up and running, you're not going to want to add the extra cost. But cylinders that, uh, you know, are harder to get to, you might want to use a different maintenance strategy. Uh, the role of sensors in this, and especially smart sensors, is you can use it as a diagnostic tool. And it's a nice low-cost way to get started using sensors. You can buy uh, a, something like our, our IntelliSense product, install it intermittently on the system to do diagnostics, uh, to help you identify before you replace the cylinder, is it the cylinder that failed this time or is it the switch that failed this time? And you can do quick quick checks on your product that way instead of just replacing things that you think have failed. The next thing we want to talk about, and we'll move on from the corrective, and we'll move up to the preventative maintenance strategies. Uh, preventative maintenance is the practice of replacing a component on a set schedule. Now, there are two ways you can schedule um, when to replace a cylinder or a component on a preventative maintenance schedule. You can do it based on time, 
or you can view it based on actuations. So you could have your set schedule. Uh, one of our large customers has a dirty dozen list that every month at the monthly maintenance, like they replace these 12 cylinders, no questions asked every time they need those cylinders to keep working. Um, there are other customers out there that put cycle counters on their system and they count how many times the cylinder is actuated and they know that you know they can get 15 million cycles out of a, a cylinder in their action in their application and so at 12 million cycles they'll replace the cylinder so that they get as much use out of the cylinder as possible without um, going into that wear zone so there are a lot of advantages to doing it this way uh, it makes budgeting easier because you know uh, every month you're going to re be spending X number of dollars on replacing these cylinders. Um, it prolongs the life of the entire system. So a lot of times when an actuator begins to slow down, you can start getting out of sequence. So it hasn't failed yet, but it's going slower than maybe it needs to. Um, that sequencing issue might cause other aspects of the machine to start wearing prematurely. So you start wearing out other components faster when you use a corrective strategy and you wait for cylinders to fail completely. Um, it helps support product quality. Again, as cylinders start to slow down or the performance changes, unless your machine is designed to account for that variable speed, it's going to affect the quality of your, your product coming off the line. So you'll want to look at that over time. And it allows you to schedule maintenance. So your maintenance guy has a set schedule of when he replaces things. You can optimize when he's doing what tasks, and it's not waiting for something to fail. Now, one of the things that you do have as a drawback to this is you don't get the full use out of your, your cylinder. Like I mentioned, the one cylinder that you know typically failed after 15 million cycles, so you replace it every 12 million cycles. Well, you're already giving up 3 million cycles right away, you know, that cylinder might have actually gone 16 or 17 million cycles on the high end of its life. So you're not using your equipment to its full benefit, and you're replacing the cylinder too soon. And failure can still uh, fail without warning. So, you know, your average is 15 million cycles. You might get one cylinder that uh, something happens and a piece of dirt comes through and gets in your airline and causes one of your seals to tear. You're going to get a failure ahead of time because of that, and you're not going to realize it. And you still have to through the issues you would with corrective maintenance strategy. So when would we use a preventative maintenance strategy? Again, looking on a cost side, it's the cost of replacing a good cylinder is lower than the cost of the system downtime. Um, so high value batch processes, uh, the example I gave before, the dirty dozen, uh, they know their batch process requires them to run, you know, seven days continuously without failure. So they're willing to spend the money to replace the cylinders ahead of that every time. Uh, if you're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so you're running high speed, high capacity manufacturing, you're going to want to make sure that when you're running, you're not going to have a failure. So you can use your pressure sensors to help you identify, or you can use a preventative maintenance strategy to prevent failure. Uh, switches or pressure sensors can actually be used um, to help in a preventative maintenance strategy. Uh, switches are going to be used to um, identify cycle time. You can feed that to PLCs and identify how, whether or not the cylinder is actuating fast enough. Uh, pressure sensors can be used to monitor the cylinder pressure on both sides and identify leaks. Um, actually, also with a smart pressure sensor, you're able to add in uh, cycle time diagnostics so you can identify when a cylinder is slowing down or speeding up because of a change in performance. So, you know, there are a couple of different ways to tackle this in a preventative maintenance strategy. But smart sensors uh, add a lot of benefits to this particular uh, strategy. So 
Moving on to the final bucket of failure or maintenance strategies. So condition-based maintenance is the practice of monitoring the condition of components to determine when a component should be replaced prior to failure. So on a lot of different things, you know, the most common um, analogy people use for condition-based monitoring is oil condition monitoring in your car. A lot of modern cars have gauges in it where they're looking at the quality of the engine oil and saying you've got 10% of life left, 50% of life left, uh, some other number of life left, and recommending when you should change your oil versus the old recommend it every 3,000 miles strategy, which is more of a preventative maintenance strategy. So the analogy continues over. Um, so by doing that, you're not spending the money on an oil change and oil filters until you've maximized the use of those products. Uh, so what does this do uh, from a manufacturing point of using it on a pneumatic actuator? Well, it reduces your downtime. You're, you know ahead of time you can correlate the condition of a cylinder to a performance criteria, and you can predict when the cylinder is going to fail. So you've got heads up before it fails that it's going to fail, and you can schedule things, and you avoid that downtime. You don't need to keep inventory of spare parts around anymore. You're able to set limits as to when the cylinder has reached a condition that you know you've got roughly two weeks left. It takes you a week to get a cylinder. So today is a good day to order that cylinder. Um, it avoids failure during critical builds. So you know the health and condition of the system before you start that build without blindly replacing uh, parts just to make sure they don't fail. Minimizes is the life of the actuator. You can get it to 15,000 cycles comfortably because you know roughly how many more cycles you're going to get until you reach failure. You can use it to schedule maintenance around how many more cycles you expect to get out of the cylinder based on its current condition. And it improves product quality similar to a uh, preventative maintenance strategy. Now some of the drawbacks to this is it is, you know, more expensive to go in there and instru add instrumentation to every cylinder in your factory. Um, you know, you might have hundreds of cylinders in your factory and adding pressure sensors to each one is probably going to be cross prohibitive. But there are going to be critical cylinders in your application that you need to monitor that a preventative or a condition-based method was going to really help. It also adds some complexity. You are adding additional hardware and additional interfaces that you have to monitor to use a condition-based monitoring not maintenance strategy. You have to check whether or not the system is within tolerance or within spec on a regular basis to see that it's trending towards failure. Now the nice thing is if you're moving from a preventative maintenance strategy or even a um, uh, the other strategy, you're going to be able to free up your maintenance man's time from doing routine maintenance to being able to do routine checks. So all he's doing is, is monitoring his the systems. He's not necessarily replacing or repairing things all the time. So that's a great advantage to the system, but it increases the complexity of the system. Pardon me. Uh, monitoring costs. So when would you use this? Again, I, keep, I tie everything back to cost because in the end that's what's driving your plan operations. So when the cost of monitoring the system is less than the cost of a failed cylinder or the cost to replace the cylinder on a regular basis. So if you're replacing a cylinder every month, every week, because you think it might fail, those costs really add up over time. So if you could go from replacing a cylinder 10 times a year to replacing a cylinder eight times a year, you might, you might pay for that monitoring some just that quickly with, you know, two fewer cycles on maintenance. So this is people that are looking for high value batch processing, 24-7 uh, operations. 
Uh, remote operations is another area where adding diagnostics makes a lot of sense. If a cylinder is located deep within a machine so that it takes a long period of time for the maintenance worker to get in there and replace that cylinder just because it's hard to get to, that's a great application for a condition-based monitoring. You don't want him to have to tear the machine apart more often than, than necessary to get in there and replace that. Or maybe you have a fleet of um, car washes. This is one of our favorite examples where you're not on site pretty much 99% of the time. If you put in a remote condition-based monitoring system in something like that, you can get feedback from your central headquarters ahead of time that your equipment's going to go down and avoid unhappy customers as a result. So difficult to reach remote operations are another great use for condition-based maintenance. So the role of sensors. This is a situation where you're going to permanently install pressure sensors um, that can monitor the condition of the cylinder seal. So uh, with our IntelliSense uh, product, you've got two sensors, on e one on either side of the cylinder, monitoring the health of the three seals inside the cylinder and reporting out um, in various ways that status and allows you to see when the cylinder is going to fail. Uh, the condition beta can then be used to schedule cylinder replacement when it makes sense for your operation. So you're not shutting people down on a regular basis or a regular basis, even uh, a random basis. They have plenty of warning that things are going to change and you can work with your uh, plant manager, your schedulers to make sure product is shipped and built in time with your operation. So condition-based monitoring really has a lot of added value um, you know, once you get past that initial startup cost, and really most of the time if you do a, a full analysis on all your cost, you can realize that that initial cost for your, your monitoring system is not going to be that prohibitive. So at that point, um, let's move into our discussion with Anna. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. That was a great start. Um, I have a few questions that I'd love to ask you before we mm -hmm. get to the audience Q&A. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, came across my mind when you were talking was the Internet of Things, which, as you know, is a really hot topic right now in, in mm -hmm. manufacturing, especially in how these intelligent devices can now communicate with one another. Um, how do pneumatic actuators fit into that Internet of Things conversation, or you know, do they fit into that conversation? Yeah, and for up until recently, they really haven't. Um, there are quite a few systems out there for monitoring uh, pneumatic cylinders. There are some people using shock sensors. There are some systems out there that are designed to measure leak detection, but they're not really integrated into the larger machine maintenance. Um, BIMBA's new IntelliSense product, however, really does allow us to start talking about the Internet of Things and using pneumatic actuators as the very edge of your machine maintenance. Um, by having the cylinders attached to the IntelliSense module, you then have access to send that data to your PLC for enhanced controls so you can monitor your cycle time and you can adjust um, system parameters elsewhere in, in the system based on your cycle time of your actuators. And you can connect it to a gateway and send that data wireless or send that data over the internet to a central repository where you can uh, do deeper analysis and do real uh, machine performance improvements by analyzing the way that cylinder is operating over a long period of time. Instead of just checking in on an inline pressure gauge every morning or every afternoon to make sure it's uh, in line. So really, pneumatics are just now moving into that conversation. And I think there's a lot of exciting things that are going to be coming down the pipe over the next uh, couple of months and couple of years in this, in this space. That's really interesting. So, um, kind of as a follow-up to that, and you kind of started to touch on this a little bit, but when it when it comes to data and data storage, you know, how would a user store all the data from a pressure sensor, especially if they're not constantly able to monitor that data as it comes in? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different ways you can do that. Like I said, um, uh, with a pressure sensor, especially a digital one, you can get data off of your, your system every millisecond. So you're really dumping a lot of data um, out there 
uh, into some sort of system to monitor that. Uh, with our IntelliSense product, we do offer our data gateway, uh, which adds that internet connectivity and also a 100 gigabytes of data storage, which gives you about a month's worth of um, data. So that gives you a pretty good idea how much data you can generate um, with one of these. But what's really great is once you have that data um, and you have a central repository that you can back it up to and you can look at uh, over time, you start noticing trends and you can use that as a way to improve your maintenance and improve your system performance over time. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a really great feature. Um, another question that I had has to do with um, how OEM machine builders, or at least a lot of them, do not always allow access to the PLC. Um, mm -hmm. Can you still use pressure sensor sensors in your maintenance plan if that's the case? Yep. So uh, pressure sensors can be used outside the PLC. There are uh, a couple of different ways to do that. Um, again, our, I, I'm going to talk about our IntelliSense system, which is designed to work as a standalone application that can communicate with a PLC and can provide that ac data to it. But if you don't have access to that data, you can really connect to it with your local PC and pull in all this data and look at it uh, directly. There are also other manufacturers out there that have uh, started developing wireless uh, pressure sensors so that they'll be able to stream that, that data to you um, in any format you need. So it's re like it's, it's really starting to get exciting the way people are looking at pressure in pneumatic applications now and providing different ways to send that data to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that flexibility I think is really important. Okay, good. Um, Finally, and before, you know, just one more question before we uh, get to the audience, but um, you had talked earlier about optimizing system performance. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I talked a little bit about it when I was discussing the, um, I believe it was the preventative maintenance strategy, where there are lots of times you might have over a cylinder uh, because you didn't realize really what you're, when you were designing the machine, you want it to make sure it was big enough, strong enough to, to do what you want it to do. So you would put in a large bore cylinder that's going to give you a lot of force, you know, a lot of life, and continue to actuate well past when you start leaking too much air. So that you're able to, by monitoring the pressure data, you're able to start realizing that, hey, I'm leaking 75% of my air out of this cylinder and it's still working. But from a cost standpoint, that 75% air leakage is too expensive for me. So I might want to optimize my cylinder by using a smaller cylinder to work in that application. The other area that you can use to help optimize is when I was discussing how cylinders fail, um, you start to look at the three different seals. And there are different reasons each of those seals is going to fail. You know, the most common uh, seal to fail is that rod seal. Um, usually an application has a bit of a side load on the cylinder. And if you can watch that seal leak develop over time, you can start to identify where and how that leak has occurred and make changes to the alignment of the machine to maybe reduce the side load uh, to improve the seal condition. Or you may notice that um, you start you have a lot of uh, piston seal failures, and a lot of times a piston seal failure um, is wet regular wear and tear going back and forth. But a lot of times, if you have contaminants in your air supply, you can get pieces of material lodged in those seals, which will eventually cause them to either wear down prematurely or even tear, creating an air leak path. And by looking at this historic data that the pressure sensors are giving you, you're able to identify that and maybe make some corrective actions to improve the filtration on your airlines or clean or replace the filter on your airlines to improve the overall system performance. Things you might not have noticed um, or thought about before you had that data. It really helps guide you towards those solutions. Um, the other area as I'm just running through some of the different things you can see 
when you're monitoring pressure on your cylinder is you can actually detect leaks um, upstream or downstream from the cylinder uh, by some changes in your line pressure coming into the cylinder or changes in the performance of the uh, on the exhaust side. So there are lots of different ways you can diagnose what's going on in your system. Okay, great. Those, those are some great examples. Um, we're going to open things up now, I think, to the audience to ask some questions. And um, again, just for those of you who are on the, the line here with us, uh, you can ask a question at any time. Just plug it into the Ask a Question box and hit Submit, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, so one of the questions that just came in, and um, you just were kind of providing some pretty good examples here as we were talking, but um, this, this uh, viewer is wondering what types of data are you monitoring and collecting? So if there's any other examples you could give us or maybe um, some mm -hmm. applications of this technology and use in the field that you've seen that's pretty interesting, um, we'd love to hear about those. Yep. So at the, at the heart, what we're monitoring is we're monitoring pressure and temperature coming in off the uh, cylinder or off the airlines feeding the cylinder. Uh, using that pressure and temp that pressure data, uh, you're able to use um, our in IntelliSense module is able to do a lot of things where it will interpret cycle count. So it, it'll count the number of cycles the cylinder has seen. It uses that pressure profile to measure how fast the cylinder is actuating. So we've got cycle time, both extend retract time as well as dwell time. So how long has the cylinder been in the extended or the retracted position? Um, we also use that to monitor seal leakage. So is there air leaking from the front of the cylinder to the back of the cylinder, or the back of the cylinder to the front, or from the front to atmosphere. So you can use that to help diagnose what's going on. The other variable we're looking at is temperature. Now, most mostly what we're using temperature for is for some calibration on our pressure sensor to make sure we're accurately measuring pressure. But the other thing it can be used for is to detect um, environmental anomalies. So if you're expecting your equipment to be working in an you know, 80 degree environment or 85 degree environment, wherever it's located in the machine, and all of a sudden you, see, you start seeing pressure spikes, well those pressure spikes that you're, or pressure, temperature spikes that you're seeing might be indicative of you know, an abnormal heat source somewhere in the system causing problems that could be causing the cylinder to fail earlier because it's in a hotter environment than it was designed to work with. Um, so those are kind of some of the things that you can use it for. Uh, the other thing you can use it for is we've actually got customers that have been able to correlate um, cylinder pressure to clamping force on an application, and they actually use that data as a first-pass filter on quality checks. So as long as the cylinder pressure is between 60 and 70 pounds at end of stroke, um, they know they've produced a good part, or at least 99% of the time have produced a good part, and they don't have to do further inspections. If the cylinder is outside of that range, they know they might have produced a suspect part, and those parts can be kicked out for uh, further review. So those are a couple of the different things you're monitoring and looking at when you're using pressure sensors. Um, the other nice thing is that we, we provide with our product is we monitor that seal condition over time and we actually provide a uh, life prediction on your cylinder. So as I was mentioning with like the oil gauge in your car that says you have 30% life left, we look at how many cycles you've gotten out of the cylinder, how much leakage has been generated by that those cycles, and we can use that to estimate how many more cycles you're going to get. So a lot of diagnostic and prognostic data uh, can be coming out of these sensors. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, we have another question from the audience. This one is from Greg, uh, and he wants to know if you can discuss more into the smart aspect of the sensors. And also, follow-up question, can you tie in other sensors to your gateway system? Okay. Yes, right now our data gateway system is um, linked to our IntelliSense module and we are only offering the uh, pressure and the temperature 
monitoring from those, those aspects. Uh, we do have plans in the future to look at other sensory capabilities, um, but right now those are the two we're focusing on because those are the two that are most critical uh, to the pneumatic actuator. But on the smart side, I kind of touched on it in my last answer a little bit, but the sensors themselves uh, have actually built-in uh, microprocessors that are doing a lot of communication translation, uh, translating to uh, RS-422 to send the signal over lar large distances within the application so that you can mount the cylinders in a harsh environment um, within your, within your or mark sensors out in the harsh environment of your, your factory, run long lead cables to your sensor interface module, and that module is collecting, just collecting the processed data coming in from the smart sensors and giving you that diagnostics and prognostic data, um, which is a little bit more than just the pressure and temperature readings that uh, a, a standard sensor would provide for you. Mm -hmm. So you touched on this uh, just a second ago um, about harsh environments, but Tim in the audience is asking if you have any additional advice for extremely harsh chemical environments. Mm -hmm. So in extremely harsh chemical environments, um, you know, the first thing you'll want to do is choose the proper uh, cylinder and seal situation in your actuator for those environments. In terms of the sensors, um, our sensors are all stainless steel. Uh, sensors. So for most harsh environments, that works pretty well. Your limitation is then going to be in your um, in your cabling. Uh, you know, most rubber cables aren't going to be uh, actuated in in that environment. So we would recommend you put some sort of uh, protective housing around uh, the sensors and the and the um, and the cabling. But the one nice thing is, the other nice thing we have going for us is the way our system works is you can mount the cylinder in the harsh environment and the sensors can be mounted up to uh, four feet away from the cylinder as long as there's no other pneumatic devices between the cylinder and the sensors. You can still monitor the condition of the sensor from a remote location. So that should give you the flexibility to mount um, the sensors in a less corrosive environment. Okay, great. So um, another question that we have here is from Joe. Um, can the system be tied into RF or Wi-Fi application? Yep. So as is the way IntelliSense works is um, it, it does not have a wireless sensor uh, system yet or uh, it's, it is an all-wired solution at this time. Our data gateway does have a built-in Wi-Fi adapter so that if you've tied into the, the data gateway, you can use the data gateway to connect out uh, to your plant Wi-Fi um, and get, get on the Internet that way. Um, we are looking long-term at possibly doing wireless sensing, but uh, at this time that was not, uh, not where we're headed. Okay. Um, another question in from Mike. Uh, can IntelliSense be used with an existing, a legacy, or uh, even a competitor cylinder? Yep. So right now, IntelliSense is designed to work with a Bemba original line cylinders. Um, it is not uh, tested or certified to work with any of our competitors' product. And some of the reasons behind every Every cylinder manufacturer uses proprietary lubes and greases to, to build their cylinders. They also use proprietary seal materials and designs and shapes. So we focused on monitoring and measuring the, the decay of our own cylinders. So we know, we know our cylinders really well and how they're going to perform over time. Um, but for legacy applications, yes, you can add in IntelliSense to those legacy applications. Uh, the nice thing about it is it's designed to be mounted using um, some inline push-to-connect connectors. So all you have to do is cut your uh, feed lines, push into the, the fitting, and you're, you're ready to go 
in terms of a pneumatic connection. So uh, it works great for legacy applications where you're using a BIMBA cylinder. If you're not using a BIMBA cylinder, uh, give us a call and we can uh, do our best to give you a competitive match and uh, let you take a look at it. Okay. Uh, so, Jeremy, you didn't think I was going to let you off the phone without asking you about cost. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, <laughs> about how much does it cost to add pressure sensors to a pneumatic actuator? Yep. So adding pressure sensors, and there are lots of different ways to do it on the market. Um, you know, if you, if you go online and you look at a digital display, just pressure monitor, they're a couple hundred bucks. Um, you know, you can buy standalone pressure sensors for uh, you know, around $100 for, for a one-off unit. And those you would have to then integrate into something um, into your system and figure out a way to use it. Our IntelliSense product starts out at $399 for the basic hardware. Um, if you want to start, get our starter kit, which is kind of everything you need to get started in testing the system and all the wires and cables, that's going to run you um, a little bit more. I believe that's uh, $549 right now. So it is, a, like I said in the beginning, there isn't an, an upfront cost, but when you start looking at your maintenance cycle and, you know, what's what's your maintenance guy's hourly rate? What's your downtime rate? You know, what does cutting two, two services out of your annual service schedule save you? You know, these, these costs go away really quick. I think you absorb that cost in, in, a, in a quick amount, short amount of time. Yeah, and you're right. You have to look at it in those terms. Um, okay, one more question. Um, yep. The applications for preventative and condition-based can be a little bit similar, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the differences? Yep. So they are very similar because both situations you're looking for, you've got some critical aspect to your system where if it fails, you're gonna, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So do you want to just continually replace the product or, you know, the, the component that may cause problems, or do you want to monitor that? So very similar applications. Um, where you want to move into condition-based monitoring is when you want to start looking at a more holistic approach to your equipment and start identifying um, the sources of the failures and doing a performance optimization and looking at other aspects of the system. So it's really when you just want to move that maintenance schedule up a little bit in terms of complexity to improve the quality of the system and maximize the life of every component in your system so you're not wasting perfectly good cylinders uh, just because it's been 3,000 cycles. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, um, it looks like we're out of questions, but um, I think that we covered a lot of ground here today, and um, this was really an interesting uh, overview of this technology and kind of how it can be used. So um, thanks, Jeremy, so much for your time today. I think everybody probably got a lot out of this. Uh, just a reminder to the viewers, we will send an email to you guys within 24 hours with a link to download this presentation if you want to view it on demand, if you'd like to share it with your colleagues, you can feel free to do so um, at that time. And um, that's it for today. Thanks again for joining us.